Good morning, church. Good morning. Awesome. You guys can just stand with me. We're going to open in prayer. And I know the Lord has something for you that I'm supposed to share. I'm just not 100% sure what it is yet, so I'm processing with him. Dear Heavenly Father, we just lift up this time to you, God. We surrender it. We surrender our hearts and our minds to you. I ask you to come in here and move on us. Lord, let it be an experience that we don't forget. Let us draw closer to you. Let us hear your word. Let our eyes and ears be open, God. Lord, we thank you for this time. In the mighty name of Jesus. I just swallowed my gum. <laughs> I can't talk with gum in my mouth. So I just wanted to, like, if I can, I, I've always struggled with, you can sit down. You go ahead and sit down. I've always struggled with worship. And I never quite understood worship. I love the preaching part in church, but I would have just been happy to miss the worship. And you know what? I love worship now. And you know what? What has changed? What has changed is that I now understand how to connect to God. And I, I want to share that with you because, you know, I feel like there's this is for somebody this morning. I don't know who. When you come in here, you know, I don't get to see you because I'm in the front row, which is great because I'm in my own, my own zone. But if you're having trouble connecting, I want to encourage you to, to block all of us out. Focus on who you're worshiping. Focus on what the Word of God says about Him. Focus on a flower that He's made. Focus on the design of something so in intricate that you and I could never even comprehend. Focus on the fact that you're redeemed. Your sins are forgiven. He's already done it. All your sins are done no matter what you did yesterday or what you may have done this morning. It is done. So don't let the enemy rob you of your time of worship. Come in here. Focus on him. Don't worry about what anybody else is going to say or think. And you worship God. If you don't know the words to the song, just close your eyes and worship God. It's not about a song that we like. It's not about the, the beat of the music. Close your eyes. If you don't know these words up here, make up your own words. I praise you, Jesus. I praise you. I worship you for who you are, for what you've done. People get healed while they're worshiping. You're in the presence of God. You're in the anointing. You get delivered while you're worshiping. You find Jesus while you're worshiping. So I just want to encourage you this morning. Let it be like no other Sunday morning for you. Don't do it for me. Don't do it for the worship team. But do it for yourself. You will grow in your relationship with the Lord. You will grow deeper. Maybe you don't want to raise your hands. That's okay. You just tune your heart in to Jesus. If you need to sit down while you worship, you sit down while you worship. That's okay. You don't have to stand up. I want to just let it be this morning. Let this morning be a, mo a momentum thing for you that that Sunday, it all changed. That Sunday, I fell in love with worship. Okay? Okay, let's enjoy it. God bless you guys. Hallelujah, Jesus.
Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. never forget what you've done for us. 
Praise your name. Praise your name. You can have a seat. We are going to celebrate communion this morning. How many know it is to be a celebration? The uh, ushers will go ahead and pass out the elements. You know, the Bible tells us to examine ourselves and be sure we're in the faith. So as the uh, ushers are passing those out, what does that mean to examine yourself to be sure you're in the faith? Well, it, it doesn't mean, you know, to try to remember every little sin that you've, you've committed and, and make sure that it's covered by the blood because all of your sin is covered by the blood. Even the sin you haven't committed yet, past, present, and future is committed by the blood. That's why we celebrate, amen, because of what Jesus did. You know, it was his body and his blood. Bible, it's, it, his blood is the atonement, is the pr- price that was paid for our sin, but his body was given for you as well. And sometimes we forget that. We don't think about the fact that his body was given. You know, I, I, I know some, some translations say broken. I don't like to say broken. I mean, you, if you think broken because your skin is broken, that kind of broken, you know, that, that's understandable. But the fact that not a single bone of his body was broken, and that was stated by John as a fulfillment of prophecy. Because what this is, is this, this is the Passover. This is the celebration when Jesus came. You know, his last supper was the Passover supper. And so we have to go back in Exodus to see what that means. And that was that was all what it was. Jesus was a fulfillment. He is the Passover lamb. You know, and in this time of turmoil we're going through, you know, the last Passover that we had, I don't remember what what instigated it, but we put a red ribbon over our front door to symbolize, you know, the what the, what the Jews were instructed to do, that the death angel would pass over their home. And so afterwards, we were, I, I was going to take it down, but my wife says, don't take it down. You know, we're not, it's not we're trusting in that ribbon, but it's a symbol that reminds us every day when we walk into our house who we are believing in, who we are trusting. We will have no fear. We are covered by the blood. The price has been paid. We are, we are safe and secure from all alarm. Amen? You know, and the other thing is, Jesus, nobody killed Jesus. You know, Jesus said, you know, nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down. I have authority to lay it down and to pick it back up again. And so that body that God prepared for him, that he willingly allowed to be killed, was raised from the dead and is still sitting at the right hand of the Father. And it is by that sacrifice that you are healed. You are healed, not not may be healed, not can be healed. You are healed. Your salvation and your healing, the price has been paid, and that's what we're remembering today. As we partake of these elements, we are identifying with the sacrifice that Jesus made with what he has purchased for us at the cross, and that's a reason to celebrate, amen? Amen. All right, so if you've uh, managed to open your... your elements and these are symbols too this is a symbol of the sacrifice so this is and symbols are important so that's why you know whatever symbols that you can use in your life to help you remember on a day-to-day basis those are powerful things it's not that you're putting any trust in that symbol it's what it what it causes you to remember and identify with amen so as I said, on the night that Jesus was uh, betrayed, you know, that he uh, stood up and he broke the bread and he said, this is my body given for you. Whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So let's partake of his body. Thank you, Jesus. same way he 
held up the cup and he said, this is the blood of the covenant, my blood that was poured out, shed for the forgiveness of the sins of many. Whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And may we never forget. God, we're going to celebrate you. May we always celebrate what you've done for us. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Still in your 
Thank you that you really don't fail us. Lord, you're with us in the flame and the fire and the water and the storm. You're with us, Lord. You'll never leave us. You'll never forsake us, Lord. You're with us here in this sanctuary this morning. You're with us, Lord, for those that are watching online. Lord, you're with them, God, today. Lord, and so we thank you, Lord, for your omnipresence, God. You are everywhere at the same time. And not only that, God, you're omnipotent. God, you're all-powerful. Lord, and you're all-knowing, Father. So there's nothing that gets beyond you. So, Lord, we thank you today, God, that we can come into your presence and we can worship you. We thank you, Lord, for what you've done in our lives in the past. And, Lord, and the, the things that you've delivered us from and set us free from, Lord, we thank you for that, God. And, Lord, we thank you that you're still working on us, God. You're not done with us, God. We are a work in progress, God. And so, Lord, today we open ourselves up, Lord, to your hand, God, to the power of the Holy Spirit. We invite the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit here in this place. We take authority, Lord, over every spirit of witchcraft, Lord, every demonic spirit that would try to interfere with this service. We plead the blood of Jesus, Lord, over every individual, God, over this entire service, God. And, and Lord, we, we render ourselves free, God, from the attack of the enemy, that no weapon formed against us would be able to prosper, Father God. But we were going to walk in your victory, God, today. And so, Lord, thank you, Lord. I pray that you teach us today, Father, from your word. And we give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. And if you agree with that, I want you to say amen this morning. Yeah. Amen. Uh, greet one another, say hello to one another, wink at each other. Good morning. Thank you, Pastor Clint, for leading us in that communion today. I was just thinking of... Pastor Christie was up here, up here, uh, opening the service this morning. Um, you, you probably don't know it, but 
I know it. I, I know the growth that I've seen in her in, in just in the time that we've been here, in the last year and a half, you know, going on two years, two years, I guess it won't be two years until February. Um, you know, and when we were in Modesto, she would every once in a while, you'd kind of have to beat her to get up there and talk to people. Um, but, you know, I, I, I hear her during the week, too. I mean, at uh, if I'm outside, I hear her and they're binding the devil and, <laughs> you know, and, and praying and all week long. I, and so uh, just a tremendous growth. So I want to commend you, Pastor Christie, for, for your growth. You know, it, it's God's intention that we never stop growing. It, it, does, it doesn't matter if you're, uh, you know, paid to be in the ministry you're in the ministry, and, you know, God's requirement is that we would grow, and, and hopefully you get that from the things that we share and, and uh, our constant encouragement of the need to be in the Word of God. There, no, nothing's going to take the place of that, uh, and if we're not in the Word of God, then it, it becomes evident in our lives as well. Last week, we started a little two-week series, so we'll finish it today, I, I believe, um, on, on scars. Scar, I, we titled it Scars That Heal, and I just want to recap uh, a little bit of what we talked about last week to kind of set it up to where uh, I feel like that we're supposed to go this week. So if you were with us last week, we talked about emotional pain that, that we carry on the inside, uh, and it's not physical, it's emotional, and many times the emotional pain is even greater than the physical pain. Uh, we talked about you never rise above an unhealed emotional scar, and so maybe some people heard me say that you don't rise above your scars. I didn't say that. I said you never rise above your unhealed emotional scar. Uh, that, that's why when we are trying to serve the Lord and we're reading our Bibles and we're praying and we're growing the Lord and we're going to church and we're doing all the things that we should be doing and, and then we, we hit this wall and most of us know what I'm talking about. We hit this wall and we, we hit the wall because maybe you know, we're reminded of something, of a tragedy or we're reminded of some a failure or rejection or betrayal. We're reminded of those things and so, and so instead of, of continuing to grow in our relationship with the Lord, we either stop or we sometimes begin to go backwards and we even go back into a sinful lifestyle, which was never God's plan, but it w definitely was the enemy's plan. Okay, so hitting the wall is not the issue. Here's why. Because we all hit walls. You, you will hit a wall emotionally and probably, you know, uh, several times during the week sometimes. We, we hit, so it's not, it's not the fact or the issue that we hit walls. It's how we respond to hitting that wall. We talked about David having, uh, you know, unhealed emotional scars when, when God called him to be, to be the king. And uh, we, we saw how the prophet Samuel was sent to Jesse's house to go and, and uh, anoint one of David's sons. He, God didn't tell Samuel which son it was, but he said anoint one of, uh, of, David's, of, of Jesse's sons to be the next king of Israel. And so we looked at 1 Samuel 16, 6. It says, uh, so when he came, he looked at Eliab and said, surely this is the Lord's anointed. And you know that, and so uh, then the Lord spoke to Samuel and says, you know what? You're looking on the outward and I don't look on the outward and, and I look on the heart. And so quit looking on the outward and, and I've not, re, I've not re, uh, chosen this guy to be the next king. And, and so, and so, you know, uh, Abinadab passes by and we find that, you know, that, that all of, all of Jesse's sons pass by except David. The reason David didn't pass by is because David was invited to this little meeting. Uh, verse 1 Samuel 16, 11, Samuel asks, are these all the sons that you have? Because he knew in his heart that, that this was not one of the guys, you know, that, that God wanted to anoint the new king. And, and, and then uh, Jesse says this, well, they're still the youngest. He doesn't even mention him by name. He says, still the, the youngest, Jesse replied, but he's out in the field watching sheep and goats. See, what... What Jesse was actually saying is this, is, is, listen, I didn't invite him because he's not worthy to be invited. That's really the message. Come on. That's the message that David was receiving. I didn't invite him because he wasn't worthy to be invited. You know what? I know you're looking to anoint somebody, but I, can't, I guarantee you it's not David. It's not, this little, it's not the youngest one. You know, he's a good sheep herder. He, he's out there watching sheep. Then Samuel says this. You know what? 
we're not gonna we're not gonna sit down and eat until until he comes. And so you know what happens is so David comes and and as soon as he walks in the room, the Lord speaks to Samuel and says, This is the one, anoint him. And and the Bible says that that Samuel anointed David in front of his father, in front of his brother. So I, I want you to think about and what we thought thought about last week was the emotional scar that David probably carried in his life, and and we went into a little bit more detail that that uh, he, he was considered to be illegitimate by his own brothers. And I shared some scriptures with you last, uh, last week about that. David wasn't mentioned by name until, until Samuel mentioned him by name after, after Jesse had to tell Samuel what his name was. He was doing the job of a hired servant. So, you know, that your, your son, if you have sheep and stuff like that, and, and you had the ability to have a hired servant, it was your hired servant that went out and took care of the sheep and stuff. And that was David's job. And one of the commentators said this, that, that David was taking care of the sheep in hopes that those bears and lions that he had to deal with would kill him. So th there was a problem here. And so da David carried with him these emotional scars. And we used that passage to kind of set up what, what we wanted to talk about. We talked about what normally caused emotional scars. Well, number one, the desire to be accepted by people around us. We all want to be accepted. Nobody wants to be rejected. But, but if by, because we have a desire to be accepted by the people around us, and sometimes, many times, they don't accept us, it causes these wounds on the inside. Uh, feeling like that you're not good enough. Now, there, there's not a person in here that, that cannot identify with some of the things that we're talking about. Feeling that you're not good, good enough or the fear of man. The, well, this is what the fear of man causes us to do. The fear of man causes us to lower our own moral values, to lower them and do stuff that we wouldn't normally do because I want to be accepted by you. You know what? And God wants you to feel accepted by him, not man. That's why he says that we're not supposed to fear man. I shared with you some personal stories last week on on emotional scars that had taken place in my, in my life. And even though they might si sound trivial to some people because they happened at a young age, uh, they weren't trivial on the inside of me. I talked about the feeling of, of failure in, in, in failing the second grade. And then the message that the enemy tagged on to that feeling of failure is that, is that you're not smart enough. You failed because you're not smart enough. You know, I, I failed because I went to four different schools in the, in, in the second grade because we, we move so often. But that's not what the enemy said. The enemy doesn't give you an excuse. The enemy gives you, you know, he, he gives you uh, something that, to cause an emotional pain or scar and says, you know what, you're not smart enough. That's why you failed. I talked about the devastation in the, in the third grade when, you know, when I, when I got picked up you know, and taken to the school for the mentally impaired and spent the day there the entire day, which was funny, you know, to everybody but me. And, and the, the message that, that the enemy tagged on to that experience is that you're defective. There's something wrong with you. You're different. You know, and so those things you can say, you know, they don't harm us, but they do harm us. They, they cause emotional scars on the inside that the enemy will continue to try to feed and continue to try to entrench himself inside. I talked about the feeling of isolation when, when my parents were the only ones who didn't show up for this play, when everybody else in a school, in a school play, when, when all the rest of the parents showed up. And, you know, and then the lie the enemy told me in that one is you're not worth it. You're not worth it. So all, all emotional scars cause pain, and we all have them when we come to Jesus. And listen, even though you come to Jesus, it doesn't mean your emotional scars go away. Just because you don't acknowledge them doesn't mean that, that they're not there. All, all scars have a source, and we all have scars. And so I gave you five sources of, of, uh, uh, of emotional scars. I'm not going to get into the detail of all of them, but if you were here last week, if you weren't here last week, you can watch it online. I want to welcome those that are watching online today. Uh, five sources of emotional scars, rejection. You know, we all want to feel loved, but... Uh, the enemy wants you to feel rejected, and the world's really good at making you feel rejected. Failure, uh, moral, moral failure, financial failure, uh, ministry failure. The failures cause scars. Abuse, talk, we talked about sexual abuse and mental abuse and physical abuse and emotional abuse and spiritual abuse. And, and we talked about many times when People have substance abuse problems that comes because they were abused earlier in their life, and they try to they try to uh, medicate, self medicate those things away, and they can't go away that way. The only way that they can be healed is through Jesus. 
and then betrayal. So we've all been betrayed. And, and you know, the enemy makes sure that, that he drives home that pain of that betrayal. You know, maybe you've been tra- betrayed because somebody cheated on you or you were betrayed because somebody stole money from you and embezzled, embezzled money from you or they've lied about you and, 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 and hurt your reputation because of the things that they said. Or maybe you trusted somebody, you know, and we talked about the, the trust of a pastor. A pastor can, can betray your trust and, and the enemy will get into that one real deep and, and try to cause the, a, a wound and a scar that you'll carry with you the rest of your life. Tragedy. Personal injury, bankruptcy, getting fired from a job, or, or an untimely death. I talked about my grandson last, you know, last week. And, and I'm not pointing out these things to make you feel bad. I'm not pointing them out so you can be reminded of how bad they hurt. I'm pointing these things out to remind you that Jesus is still in the healing business. The spirit of our, of our scars. It might sound funny. The spirit of our scars. All scars have a spiritual element to them. You'll see that. But you think about this. The, the problem with emotional pain is not the pain itself. The, the problem with emotional pain is this, is the devil continues to remind you of it. It stays there. It's entrenched in you. You know, I, I think because I've done counseling for so long, you kind of get a you kind of get a read on people in different areas in their life and, and things that, that they walk through, things that I walk through myself and things that I hear people that have walked through and, and how it affected them. And, and many times when you, when you are counseling somebody who's come out of an abusive relationship, uh, and those of you that have, have been abused will totally understand this, that sometimes just a smell will target, will trigger. Just a smell will trigger the memory of, of that emotional abuse or that physical abuse or that sexual abuse. You know, uh, just the sound of somebody's voice, just the sight of something will trigger, you know, the, the, the pain of that. And so let me ask you this, where does that come from? It, it sure doesn't come from Jesus. So where does it come from? It comes from the enemy because the enemy entrenches himself inside these emotional wounds and these scars that are not healed. And, and he will keep you there your entire life. That's his plan. See, the, the devil's plan is to hurt you and keep you hurting. That's his plan. Jesus' plan is to heal you and keep you healed. If you look at, look, uh, just read the New Testament. I mean, it, the New Testament is filled with accounts of Jesus healing people. I, I just wrote down three scriptures. Luke 19, 11, Jesus began to speak to them about the kingdom of God and curing those who needed healing. Uh, Matthew 8, 7, Jesus said, I will come and heal them. Listen, he still comes and heals us. Matthew 19, 12, uh, 19, 2, he says, large crowds followed them, and he healed them there. See, how, how does the devil remind us of our unhealed emotional scars? You know, many of you were here last year when we, I, I taught the series on the three voices of the supernatural. And the, the devil doesn't come to you at, in some demonic, scary voice. Remember we talked about those three voices, the voice of self, the voice of the enemy and the voice of God. I was telling Pastor Clint yesterday, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, in Modesto, I would teach this series once a year. Why? It's because it's so practical. It, it helps us. It, who's talking to me? Come on. You, you have voices in your head. Some of you have more than three voices. We joked about that. But the three voices we're talking about is the voice of self, the voice of the enemy, and the voice of God. And so the enemy does not come, doesn't come to you in some demonic, scary, you know, that kind of, that, you know, like you hear on, on you know, uh, some scary movie. He doesn't come to you like that. He comes to you inside your head as your own voice. That, that's why it's so tricky that you need to know the characteristics of those voices. You know, who, would, who is talking to me? And I, I can identify that by knowing the characteristic. You know, would Jesus tell me this? No, you know what? If it's something that the devil's telling you, it's not something that Jesus would tell you. And so it, it's, it's, it's understanding, you know, who, who's talking to me because the, that's the way that the enemy is going to come in. And it, the devil will come in and speak to you things like this, that you, you are not, you're not worth it. You're, you're, not, you're not worthy. You're, you're defective. You're different. There's something wrong with you. And listen, we tend to believe, this is, this is a fact, this is human nature. We, we tend to believe the, the message that we receive in our head that's reinforced, reinforced or, 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 or continued. 
You know, the, the thing that we hear in our head is the thing that we believe. That's why the Bible says this, by reading the Word of God, our mind gets renewed. That, that's why I'll never apologize almost every Sunday I'm harping at you. I know you get tired of hearing it. Every Sunday I'm telling listen, you know what? You can't go by just what I talk about here on Sunday. you got to open this book. you gotta, you got to open it up on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. you got to get up in the morning. And, you know, I was talking with somebody this week about this, is that we have to make an appointment with God. I, I have an appointment early in the morning before Christy gets up. I have an appointment early with God that I get up, you know, because once she, get, once she gets up, we, we start talking, and, and then I lose my appointment. Not, not that I'm, I'm not glad she gets up. I'm just saying this is that. If I don't get up early in the morning, then I miss my time with God. And so and it's during those times that God speaks to me and gives me thoughts and, you know, and, and ministers to my spirit. And so, and so I have to read the Word of God. Why? Because it renews my mind. It makes me think better. You know, it changes the way that I think. And it'll do the same thing for you. You, you have to have the Word of God down in. I'll, I'll talk about more of that in a minute. The message is that that continue in our mind, that are reinforced and re repeated are the things that we tend to believe. That's a fact. Adam and Eve were deceived by the devil, the Bible says in Genesis. They, you know, they disobeyed God. God told them, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which they went and did. They ate from the, 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 knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, how did that happen? That happened by a thought. That happened by a thought that was, that was enforced and repeated by a devil. That told him this, you're not going to die. You're not going to die. You know, God said you're going to die. You're not going to die. The, the original lie was this. The and, and listen, it's still just as strong and in effect today. The original lie is that you will be like God. Look at what they are doing. I don't know if you watch the news and, and some of the, the technology and the things that are coming out, you know, the, with the artificial intelligence. I mean, some of the things that they are, they are doing today is they are using artificial intelligence and combining it with pig's brains. Come on. Where do you think this is going? That, that they think that in, within the next 10 or 15 years that, that they can create a human being, come on, they can create a human being that could co connect with the internet, connect with the, the cloud, the web, you know, without a device. That, that's real. That's happening today. That's happening right now. What, what are they doing? They are playing God. That I could, I could be like God. And so, so that was the original lie that the enemy told them, that, that you, you know what, you're not going to die and you'll be like God. So why, 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 why do people not receive Christ? It's because they think that, that, you know, that, that heaven's not real. You know? And so the enemies told them, you know what? Uh, you might die, you might not die. But if you died, you, know, you, know, you just kind of go to oblivion. You know, that you're going to be shocked to find out that you don't go to oblivion. That you know, It's appointed for man to die once and then stand before the Lord. Face judgment from God. Hebrews 9.27. So Genesis chapter 3, verse... 9 says this, and the Lord called to Adam. You know, after, he had, after he had disobeyed God, the, the Lord called to Adam and he says this, where are you? Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And then the Lord said this, who told you you were naked? So where'd that message come from, Adam? Who, who, who have you believed that, that, that didn't come from me? Who told you you were naked? So, you know, listen, God does not ask you questions because he doesn't know the answer. God asks you questions so that you will see the answer. Look at throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament that any time that God asked the question, it was not because he did not know the answer. Elijah kills these 450 false prophets of Baal, and then, and then Jezebel says that she's going to kill him, and so he runs for his life, and he hides in a cave, and, and then the, you know, the, the Lord speaks to Elijah, and you know, there was, a, there was a, a tornado, and the Lord wasn't in the wind. There was a fire, and the Lord wasn't in the fire, and, and then, and then the, in a still small voice, God speaks to Elijah, and he says this, what are you doing here? You know what, when, when God asked Elijah, what are you doing here, it wasn't because he didn't know what he was doing there. I tell you, Elijah was there because he was depressed. He was there because he was discouraged. He was there because he was listening to a lie from the enemy and a thought that was reinforced by something that did not come from God. 
Jesus looks at Peter and he said, who do men say that I am? He didn't say that because he was having an identity crisis. Who do men say that I am? He, 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 he knew the answer. He knew the answer when he asked it. So when, when Adam's eyes were open, the devil instantly began to tell him, listen, uh, you need to go hide yourself. There, there's something wrong with you. You're, you're, you're defective now. And get this, God doesn't love you anymore. You've sinned. You know what? You're, you're worthless. You're junk. You, you, know, you, you might as well just kill yourself. There's, there's something wrong with you. So it's, it's the same lies that he tells us, that you're worthless. You're defective. There's something wrong with you. And get this, and God doesn't love you anymore. That's why when, when, when we sin, the Bible says that we have an advocate with the Father. That, uh, as Pastor Clint said this morning, that, that the blood of Jesus not only forgive us of our sin in the past, but, but uh, our sins today and our f- sins in the future. It's been paid for by the blood. By, by the blood, it's been paid for. See, God's still in the business of redeeming pain, and Jesus is still in the business of healing scars. God uses redeemed pain. What do I mean by that? God uses redeemed pain. You know that I was talking with Cindy Tuesday night at prayer. Uh, we were talking about something that was said earlier that uh, they'll never follow a leader without a limp. What, what, what do we mean by that? So somebody that has a limp is because something's happened in their life. And leaders that don't have limps uh, are acting like they've never had any problem in their life. You don't want to follow somebody who acts like they've never had a problem in their life. And so people can relate to other people's scars. You know, if, if, if you've been through something and I saw that you've made it through that, you know what, you are a source I can come to and say, how do I get through it? So, you know what, so people can relate to other people's scars. What people cannot relate to is people who pretend like they have no scars. Or they pretend like they have it all together. Uh, several years ago, I was invited. I lived in Modesto, but I was invited to Arizona to preach in a tent revival to outlaw bikers. Wow. And it was just a challenge to be invited. You know, I had a friend that had a whole ministry to outlaw bikers, and so he went to to Arizona, which it was a, like a, a Sturgis type thing where all these bikers were gathered together. And he said, Tom, would you come and, and preach? And I thought, what am I going to preach about? I, I've been preaching about marriage and stuff. That's what I'm, you know. And so I really feel like I was supposed to go. And so, and so I go and here I am. And these were real. It was real. I'm standing on the stage and these are real outlaw bikers. This tent was filled with out, these outlaw bikers. And that big, you know, big burly guys and, 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 you know, no shirts on or, or just have a leather vest on and, and so, and, and so I'm, I'm preaching, and I forgot what even I was supposed to be preaching about, but I felt like the Lord told me to talk about their mother. Now, that's <laughs> in a nice way. Here's why. They all like their moms. They all like their moms. They might not like their dad, but they like their moms. And so during the altar call time, I, with whatever it was I preached on, I remember asking this question, let me, let me ask you this. Would your mom be proud of how you're living today? I'm t- and I got goosebumps just saying it because what I, I thought, why did I say that? Because you don't see their eyes get big, you know. And, and you know, when you're preaching, I, I was just saying, you know, when, you, when I walk up here, you think people ask, what's it like to go up and preach? You know, it probably feels like what it feels like going into the lion's den. That's kind of what. Because, because you know what? I'm not facing you. I am facing an enemy that, that wants to uh, contradict everything that I'm saying up here. That wants to steal the thought that, just, that, that, that God places in your heart. He's there right now to try to steal that thought out of your mind. Why? Because he wants you to leave the same as when you came in. But Jesus said, I've come to set you free. And that, you know what? That when you leave, you leave different. Why? Because you've been with me. And I remember looking at these guys and saying, would your mom be proud of how you're living today. And, and they start getting, you can see, they squirm in their seats. I, so I can see when you're squirming. That's not, you're giving yourself away. So now you're sitting like this. You don't want to. 
Would your mom be proud of how you're living today? And I forget the other things I started talking about. And I asked them to bow their heads. And when they bowed their heads, I could, I could do, see them doing, they, they were just starting to break. The Holy Spirit was just moving across that room. And I'm telling you, we had a tremendous altar call. We had a tremendous altar call. And, you know, they used to call me Tommy Dangham over Hell Smith. And so I'm guaranteeing you I was Dangham over Hell as well at the same time. But my point is this. How can, how can God put me in a place that I can relate to outlaw bikers and convey a message to them? And, and God can also put me in a place where I could be friends with the county prosecutor. What? How, how is that? It's because it's because of this. Is is that I don't hide my scars. I, I'm not. I'm not embarrassed of them. I'm not embarrassed of them. You know, it's not comfortable to talk about them sometimes, but I'm not embarrassed of them. Why? Because it's it's in those in those healed emotional scars that people get healed. And so when. When I'm talking to you and, you and you feel like that we can identify with one another, where's that coming from? It's, it's really a gift from the Holy Spirit because, because of things that, I, that I've walked through or I've walked people through, you know, in, in, in years of ministry. You, you can learn. I can Listen, I can learn from your scars as well. I, I can learn, you know, how those scars affected you, and I can, I can learn how they can be used to be positive or I can, I can know how they can be used to be negative in your life. So God wants to redeem your scars so that you can help others as well. Don't be embarrassed of them. Listen, Jesus, Jesus was not embarrassed of his scars. John chapter 20, verse 27. Then he said to Thomas, remember Thomas said, you know what, I'm not going to believe unless I put my fingers in his side and, and I see the scars in his hand, I'm not going to believe. And then Jesus shows up and he looks at Thomas and he says, put your finger here. And look at my hands. Put your hand in the wound in my side. Don't be faithless. Believe. Jesus was not embarrassed of his scars. Jesus' scars represent this, our freedom and our healing. That's what it represents. And, and, And our healed scars represent what Jesus still does in other people's lives. Come on, man, we are in this thing together. And, 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 we, you know, and then the things that we go through and the things that we face in life, you know, God brings us through those things so that we can minister to other people. And that, that's the way that the Holy Spirit works. And we are the voice of God. And, and, and so when God is influencing us through the power of the Holy Spirit and, and, you know, we walk through something, listen, I can lay hands on you and pray for you because I understand, you know what, I'm moved with compassion. That's what, that's what caused Jesus to heal people. He said he was moved with compassion. And so whenever I know that, you know what, you struggle with drugs or you struggle with alcohol, I know what it feels like to do that. And I can put my hands on your head and pray for you. And there's power in that prayer. Why? Because Jesus was moved with compassion and so are we. We we are the instruments that God's going to use, especially in these last days. Don't be ashamed. Don't be embarrassed of your scars. You you can wear them like a trophy because there are things that God has brought you through. They're healed. You know what? You're on the other side of them now. So here's the million dollar question. How do I get my scars healed? Because here we are sitting here, and listen, we have emotional scars. See, sometimes we, we get confused about, about uh, where those scars are. You know, how, how come I'm not seeing those, un, those unhealed scars? Or, or maybe we say this, I'm good, don't have any, you're a liar. So how do we get them healed? Number one, we have to make Jesus the Lord of our pain. Say that with me. Make Jesus the Lord of my pain. See, in order to uncover these scars, we have to ask ourselves this question. What areas in my life uh, are off the table for anybody to talk about? I'm not asking you to answer me. I'm just asking you to ask yourself that. Because in that question, you're going to find unhealed emotional scars. I'm not talking about areas that you're fine with talking about. I'm talking about areas that you're not fine with talking about. What areas in your life that are off the table that, you know, that, that, that 
uh, nobody, nobody needs to talk about, nobody needs to know about. Are there areas in, in my life that I buried and, and then I, I refuse to look at? Well, that's where we find emotional scars. And, and I, you know what? I, I've, God still is healing emotional scars in me. I, I remember just this last week, I was, I was thinking of this question. What areas of my life have I buried that I refuse to look at? And, you know, and God brought an area in my life. You want to know what it is? It's none of your business. Amen. It's between me and God. But he reminded me of it. And so what was he reminding me for? He, was he reminding me so I continue to carry it around? No, he was reminding me because he wanted me to give it to him. He said, give me that pain. Give me that pain. You, you're not designed to carry this pain. Give, give me that pain and I'll carry it for you. See, th- that's where the, we find our, the, 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 the scars are in the secret. And they're in the secret because the enemy loves shame. He, he, he loves for us to waller in shame. And, and, and we are deathly afraid that somebody would find out this this, you know, this area in my life and, and have it exposed. And so that's the area that the enemy operates in and lives in. So, so we try to hide it from everybody. And in the process of that, we even try to hide it from Jesus, who knows about it all the way, you know, already, by the way. He, he already knows. He, he, he was there when it happened. Remember, he, he's omnipresent. Well, it wasn't his plan for it to happen. You know, bad stuff happens in our life because we live in a sinful world. That's what, that, you know, that's why bad things happen to good people because we live in a sinful world. It's not God's plan. He doesn't, he doesn't plan for you to have per, uh, hurts and pains, but we do have hurts and pains. He plans to heal you of them, though. And he is the only one that can heal you of that pain. When we expose our, our pain and our scars to Jesus... They don't get worse, they get healed. They go away. And you know, the only way that you'll find that out is you try it. That we have these emotional hurts and these scars that are not healed in our life. And, and in our prayer time, we say, God, listen, you know about this. And you know, and I've, I've not talked to you about it, but it hurts. And I ask that you would touch this today. And I ask you to take this pain away. Guess what happens? Supernaturally, God begins to take the pain away. I don't know how he does it, but you know, I, I'm not God. I, all I do know is that he does do it, he, and, and he works through the power of the Holy Spirit that way. So here's the truth. Jesus will never touch that pain until he's Lord of it. So until we invite him into that pain and surrender that pain to him, he won't do anything about it. You can wish it away. not going to go away. Look what Jesus said in Revelations. He said this himself. Behold. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens it, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. And a, lot, a lot of times we use that scripture as a salvation scripture, that, that he stands at our heart's door, which he does. He stands at our heart's door and knocks. And when we open our heart's door, he comes in and, ha- and, and has fel- dines with me and means that has fellowship with us. We have an intimate relationship with him. But listen, it doesn't stop at salvation. It stops at our, our pain and our emotional hurt and the things that we carry around. You know what? He says, listen, I, I'm standing at the door and knocking at your emotional pain today. If you will open that door and you'll hear my voice, I'll come in and I'll heal that thing. You know what? But you have to invite me in. That's my point is you have to allow Jesus to be the Lord of your pain. So often we get confused with why, you know, why we still have this pain. Here, here's why. Uh, we, we've made Jesus the Lord of our life. We really have. We're born again. We're a Christian. We, we've asked Jesus to forgive us of our sin and come into our life. And, and, and in doing so, the Bible says that supernaturally our sins are forgiven and we have a relationship with Jesus now. But then after we have this relationship with Jesus, and, and you notice that that when somebody who first gets saved and really gets saved, how on fire they are for God. And then, you know, those of us that have been Christian for a long time try to pour that water on that and put that out. Oh, just settle down, settle down, settle down. You know what? No, we need more people like that. Come on. We need more people like that on fire for God. How many remember being on fire for God? Okay, I hope you're convicted. So what happens is this, is that, is that we're growing in this relationship with God. You know, we're saved. We know we're saved. Our sins are forgiven. But then we hit that wall. Come on. This is where the enemy, this is all the enemy's business right in here. We hit that wall, and then we begin to doubt, am I saved? 
Why? Because we hit that wall and many times go back into the sinful lifestyle. It doesn't mean that you're not saved. It means this, that the enemy's having victory in your life. You, you have to re-agree with God, listen, that, that your sins are forgiven. He's taking away your sin. And what you're dealing with is an emotional scar that the enemy's pouring into and trying to destroy your life with it. So Jesus stands at the door and knocks and says this, let me be the Lord of that pain. You know that he will never force himself in your pain. He, he will never force you to be healed. Look it up in the, in the New Testament. The people were healed that were healed were people that were looking to get healed. The people that were healed were the people asking him, Lord, would you heal me? And you know what? It wasn't, you know, the, the, the blind beggar wasn't just sitting there quiet as Jesus was walking by. He's going, Jesus, hey, Jesus. And, you know, and all the people are going, hey, shut up, man. Jesus is here. I know, Jesus, Jesus. And so, you know, what did, Jesus goes over and you know, what, what do you need me to do? Well, I'm blind. What do you need me to do? I want to see. Okay, here, receive your sight. Jesus healed those who were looking to be healed. And so, and so we have these emotional scars. I hope this is sinking in this morning. We have these emotional scars and these pains and these things that have happened in our life that the enemy has tried to use to destroy us with. And Jesus is saying this, listen, I want to heal those, but I need you to allow me to be the Lord of them. I need you to allow me to be the Lord of your pain. See, I, I'm not asking you to expose your pain to me because I can't help you other than give you counsel. I'm asking you to expose your pain to Jesus because he can help you and he can heal you from it. So we need to make Jesus the Lord of our pain and give it to him. So how do I get my emotional scars healed? Number two is that make the word of God your supreme truth over your scars. I already preached at you for a few minutes on the word of God. I'm going to do it again. How do we do that? We, we have to allow the Word of God to change the way we think. How do we do that? We read the Bible. That's how we do it. So, so again, last year in the, the three voice messages, we, we memorized the passage of Scripture, and, and hopefully some of you still have it memorized. And, and we remember it by 2 Corinthians 10.4. Remember 10.4 and CB talk means amen. It means I agree. So 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3, 4, and 5, if you remember, it says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. For, I'm not hearing you. For pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That was my turn. Now your turn. Let's do it again. For though we walk in the flesh, you can read it. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God. Our time is not good. For the pulling down strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. This was the central theme of this entire series. Why? Is because this is the warfare that we're in right here for your thoughts. For the pulling down of strongholds. So what is a stronghold? We're going to break this down. A stronghold, strongholds are thoughts that are entrenched or embedded inside an unhealed emotional scar. A stronghold. It's how we think. Thoughts that, thought that you're never going to be healed. Marty, if you thought you could never be healed, that would be a stronghold. Inside your brain that the enemies continue to tell you, you know what, you're not going to get healed, you're not going to get healed. And, you know, and the enemy wants us to agree with that so that we don't get healed. But Marty doesn't believe that, see. He, he's continuing to believe that, you know what, that by Jesus' stripes he is healed. And so we're, we're, and God has shown us that he's going to be leaping like a gazelle across the front of the sanctuary. And so, and so that's, what, that's what we're looking for. And so, and so that's a stronghold. A stronghold is a, this, this thought that gets entrenched inside the, this uh, this. Uh, you know, unhealed emotional scar. I was thinking this morning, you know, like the, the old World War I and World War II movies. Remember, they dug these trenches. Remember, and the guys, the soldiers would get down in the trench. I mean, know what I'm talking about. What did they call those trenches? And strongholds. Stronghold. It was a stronghold. It was a, it was a place where, where the enemy could get in. The enemy, could, they called them foxholes too, but uh, for my illustration, they're strongholds. And so uh, <laughs> it's where the enemy could get in, where the enemy could get in and... and and, you know, their opponents wouldn't be able to infiltrate them. 
And so what the Word of God calls us to do is this, is to pull down, pull down those strongholds. It's a thought. It's a thought, you know, I'm never going to be healed. It's not going to make it. I'm going to fail. It's a thought. It's a thought. You need to pull down the strongholds. So it says this, uh, casting down arguments. So what is an argument? Arguments are thoughts that accuse God of wrongdoing or disagree with the truth of God's Word. So who are you going to believe? Okay, so... So uh, uh, an argument or, um, you know, and when I memorize the scripture, is casting down imaginations. Imaginations are, are thoughts that, that we have in our minds that are not real, okay? Argument, the same thing. So they accuse God of wrongdoing or disagree with the, with the truth of God's word. And, and Paul tells us that we need to cast them down. We need to throw them down. See, the problem is not with God's word. The problem is with your thinking, and that's what he's trying to say here. See, so the answer to your pain is found in the word of God. And unless you're in the word of God, that's why the devil tries to keep you from reading this all the time. Because he knows, you know, he knows this. He knows that when you read this, your mind is renewed. When he knows when you read this, you start believing it. He knows when you believe it, your life starts changing. He knows when you believe it, you know, you, you begin to influence other people. He knows that. That's why he tries to keep you out of the word of God. This is the most powerful thing that we can do on earth. Is to learn this and memorize it and, and write it down. And I'm not going to quit saying it. Put it on little cards on your, in your bathroom mirror. I know you spend a lot of time there. That way you're blow drying your hair. You can, if you don't have hair, you're brushing your teeth. There's a passage of scripture. Be some passage of scripture that you can memorize and carry it on a little piece of paper on a three by five card. And put it in your pocket, and you know whenever you're not doing something and not you're not on Facebook. I didn't say that, but you know, read that scripture. Memorize the Word of God. Memorize. I, I'm and I'm telling you that what I'm telling you to do. I do the same thing. I am, I am right now trying to memorize, and I will get it done, the 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah. I want to memorize the whole chapter. And so I'm going to do that. And when I do it, I'm going to stand up here and quote it. So you, and, so, and I give you, the, give you the permission to say, Tom, how are you doing on memorizing that? Because that will remind me that I need to have it in my office. I have it printed out. It's pretty long. I don't know if Pastor Clint quoted a pastor scripture the other day. It's, it's impressive. To me, it's impressive. It might not be impressive to you. He quoted a pastor scripture the other day. I know it was a long passage of scripture. I don't remember which one it was, but it was good. For and you, you can tell, you know, there's a difference between me giving you my word and me standing up here and giving you God's word. See, there's a difference between me telling you, you know what, you can be set free and me standing up here saying the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imagination, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing it to captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ. There's a difference in those two things. Why? Because it is the word of God. It's powerful and it's mighty. Thank you, the two of you. High things. What are high things? High things are, are thoughts that, that take the place of God's direction in our life. I always try to think of illustrations. So what would be, what would be a, a, an illustration of a high thing? A thought that tells you this, that you, you tried something that failed and you failed at it, and so you're always going to be a failure at it. That's a high thing. That, that thing has made itself more powerful than the Word of God in your life. Listen, I've seen people start out in ministry and have shaky starts in ministry. And because they didn't fail or they, they didn't you know, succeed at it at the very beginning, that they quit. And, and when they quit, the enemy began to tell them, you know what, you're never going to accomplish that. You're never going to be used by God in that area because you're a failure and you're always going to be a failure. That's a high thing. That's something that the enemy entrenches in our mind. You know, and, and, and so unless we correct that with truth, unless we correct it with the word of God, then what will happen is this, is that I will never again attempt to do that kind of ministry. Uh, you know why? Be because it was something maybe that God called me to do, but because of the fear of failure and because that, that, that this thought has been, has been reinforced and, and repeated in my mind and in my heart, then what's going to happen is this, is that I will sit, you know, and say, well, you know what, I've just, you know, I've tried, but I didn't, I didn't make it. You, you, you're never, you're never going to accomplish anything if you, if you stop the first time you fail. I mean, we went, look at the inventions that we have. I mean, you know, the light bulb, how many times did they try to invent that? Probably three or four, huh? No, and so, and so 
We fail, we fail at stuff. We, we, fail in, we fail in our tests sometimes. You know, if, uh, if you're in schoolwork, I mean, uh, come on, you're probably like me and failed some tests or didn't show up on test day. And you find out you have, they have a thing called makeup tests. Bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. The emotional scar, listen, the emotional scar that you carry cannot be healed if you continue to believe the lie that the enemy's telling you about it. And the only place, the only place in the way that you can replace that lie is to believe the truth of the Word of God. Say this out loud with me. We do not war according to the flesh. God's word is my weapon. Okay. We do not war according to the flesh. Say that again. God's word is my weapon. Now, if you got up every morning and told yourself that, it would change the way you think. Why? Because you're, you're talking about what 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 3, 4, and 5 is talking about. You just, it's an abbreviated form of it that, that I don't war, I don't fight according to this flesh and blood. But I fight according to this spiritual weapon that God's given me that's not carnal, but it's mighty through God. And what's it do? It pulls down strongholds. It casts down arguments and imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And it brings into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And so when the enemy comes in to try to lie to you about something, just turn and ask Jesus, Jesus, what do you think about that? What do you think about that? And you know what? And Jesus is going to revert you back to the word of God and say, let me tell you what I think about that. I think the devil's a liar. I think that he's telling you a lie. You know what? That I've made you more than a conqueror. You're not a loser. You're a winner. That's what I think about that. So here, here's God's word for you. I, I am worth it. I am worthy to be loved. I, I am not a failure. I am a conqueror. I, I'm not a loser. I am a winner. I'm going to make it. That, that's, that's what God thinks about me. Now, again, I want you to say this with me. I want you to say this out loud. I am worth it. I, actually... Look at somebody. Don't just say it to me. Look at somebody. Get, get them in eye contact with somebody. And I want you to say this. I'm worth it. I'm worth it. Marty, you're not looking at nobody. <laughs> say, I'm worth, I'm worth it. Say this. I'm worthy to be loved. Tell them. I'm Tell them this. I am not a failure. Not a failure. Say that one again. I am not a failure. Not a failure. Tell them this. I am a conqueror. I am not a loser. I'm a winner. Let's say that one again. I am not a loser. I'm a winner. I am going to make it, doggone it. And people like me. Say that. You're going to say that. People like me. Listen, now I'm going to reinforce that that is exactly how God views you. Let me even put it this way. This is what God himself says about you. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you a future and a hope. Listen, losers don't have a future and a hope. Failures don't have a future and a hope. So we know that when we hear a message that I'm a loser or a failure, we know that that's not you know, intended for us. Here's why, because I know how God views me. God views me as more than a conqueror. More than a conqueror is somebody who, want, who goes and conquers something that, that once conquered them. So, you know, if you've beaten an addiction, then you know what? You are more than a conqueror because that thing conquered you one time. And through the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, now you have conquered that thing. You know what? And so when, when the enemy comes and tells you these lies that you're, you're worthless and you're not lovable and you're not going to make it, you know what? You need to turn and say, Jesus, let me take that thought captive. What do you think about that? Well, I think that the devil's a liar. That's what I think, that, that he's under your feet. That's what I think. I think that you are more than a conqueror, that you're going to make it, that I, I have a plan for you, and it's not a plan of evil. It's a plan to give you future, the plan to give you hope. That's, that's my plan for you. That, that's what the Word of God does on the inside of us. Come on, that'll put some pep in your step. You have to command your emotional scars to be obedient to the Word of God. 
Quit believing Satan's lie. Because, listen, if you don't, those scars become strongholds and we kind of repeat the process of everything we just talked about. So how do I get healed from these emotional scars? I've got to make the word of God supreme, the supreme truth over the lie that the enemy's telling me. Thirdly, how do I get my emotional scars healed? You have to forgive anybody who scarred you. How many have been scarred by somebody? I'll wait. You've been scarred by somebody. Somebody's done something, said something, done something to hurt you. How many raise your hand? I want to know who I'm talking to. We got most everybody. We want to welcome the angels that are here today. We are, appreciate the presence of the Lord from the angels that are here. They have never been emotionally wounded or scarred. You got to forgive anybody who scarred you. And get this. You got to learn to forgive yourself. You know, often it's so much easier to forgive other people than it is to forgive yourself. And you know, you know the word of God is is kind and uplifting. But the Bible tells us that sometimes the word of God's corrective. So, sometimes God has to take the kid gloves off and and cause you to mature a little bit. And and that gets painful sometimes. But it's a pain that's going to lead to your healing. So it is easier a lot of times to forgive other people than to forgive ourselves. I, I, I went through a season, I went through a season in my life that I had, I had failures and did a lot of things that were not pleasing to God. And, uh, and I had a hard time forgiving myself. And I, I remember exactly where I was at when the Lord spoke to me about this. I was... I was asking him, Lord, why is this pain still so active in my life? God, God how can how come I can't I can't forgive myself? I, and I really had forgiven everybody that I could think of that had scarred me or hurt me. I I, I couldn't think of anybody that had offended me that that that. I couldn't think of anybody that I hadn't forgiven, and, and I'm still having this pain. And then I said, God, why, why can't I forgive myself? And this is how the Lord responded, and which is, it was kind of shocking at first. And he said, well, you got to humble yourself. And I thought, humble myself? Yeah, you got to humble yourself. And I thought, what do you mean, Lord? And, and he said, well, Tom, he said, you know, when you preach and, and, uh, and you tell people that if they confess their sin to me, that I forgive their sin? I said, yeah. He said, do you believe that? And I said, yes, I do. So you believe that if you tell people that if they confess their sin to God, he's faithful and just to forgive them of their sin and cleanse them from all righteousness. Do you believe that's true? Absolutely believe that's true. And he said, then... Why don't you apply that to you? Listen, th these are emotional scars that we're not, we're not really proud of, but they're things that will help other people. He said, why, 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 don't, why don't you apply that to yourself? And I thought, what are you talking about, Lord? And he said this. He said, the reason that you don't do that is because you think you're better than everybody else. Gee, that's not what I, I'm looking for that mercy and grace. I, I'm not looking for that. God, what do you, you know, I, you know, start trying to take that thought captive. No, the Lord was talking to me. He said, I told you you need to humble yourself. See, Tom, the reason that you've not been able to forgive yourself is you think you're better than everybody else. And you, you believe that I can forgive their sins, but I can't forgive your sins because you think that they're better than, and you're better than them. So you need to repent of the pride in your life. He had my attention. 
And I did. I had to repent for the pride of my life. And guess what happened? He allowed me to forgive myself. Now, listen, am I proud telling you that testimony? No. But it's how God works. And man, and, and, it, and, and in healing these emotional scars, it is painful. Even the healing process many times is painful. But what we have to do is we have to give him that pain. We have to make him the Lord of that pain. And then we have to forgive other people. People have hurt us. And, and listen, you will not be forgiven unless you forgive. That's just what the Bible says. So it's not negotiable. It's not like, you know what, I'll forgive this one, but I'm not going to forgive that one. You know what? The vengeance is mine, says the Lord. That's why we don't forgive is we want something bad to happen to that person because they hurt us and they scarred us. Listen, that's not your business. That's God's business. And, and he will. He will deal with them. If they, if they are unrepented and, and their hearts are not right, God will deal with them. But God's trying to deal with you right now. So he says this, that, that if you want to be forgiven, then you have to forgive. I saw this quote. And it, it's so truthful. And it said this, forgiveness does not excuse those who hurt you. Forgiveness releases you from the hurt. See, so when I, when I for, if you hurt me and I forgive you, it doesn't matter how you respond to that. It doesn't matter. If, if you say, if I tell you I forgive you, you say, well, I, I'm not taking your forgiveness. It doesn't matter. Because if I forgive you, what I've just done is release myself from that hurt. Now I've, I've enabled God to come into that pain and begin to heal that pain. There's a passage of scripture that's not on our it's not on our overhead, but if you're taking notes, it's 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7. It says this humble, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he might exalt you in due time. Casting all your cares or casting all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. What, what does that mean? That means this, is that God can't heal us until we give it to him. Casting all your cares or all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. What it means is this, is that while you're busy caring about everything else, God's busy caring about you. And, and God can't help you until you cast it down, throw it down. The same things that, that Paul was talking about in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4, 4 and 5, to cast it down, throw it down, uh, you know, pull it down, get rid of it. You, you're not supposed to carry it. You, you're, not, you're not designed to carry it. What we're designed to do is take those things and throw them down at the feet of the Lord. So the things that we're anxious about, the things that we care about, he's talking, not talking about your children, that you care about them and, and your family you care about. He's, not talking about. he's talking about the things that the enemy's trying to use, those strongholds that the enemy's tried to use you know, to pull you away from your relationship with God or pull you away from church, to pull you away from the things that God's called you to do, your calling and your ministry. You know, he says, I want you to take those things, those anxieties, I want you to throw them down at the foot of the Lord. Throw them down. And then you know what you're supposed to do? Leave them there. Because so often what happens is we say, man, Pastor Tom, I agree with that. I am going to throw my anxieties down here at church. Thank you. I'm glad I came to church today. I'm throwing them down. And we, and we pray a prayer at the end of the service. And you, and you cast down those anxieties and those worries and those strongholds and, and all those things. You lay them at the, foot of the, at the foot of the cross. You know what? And you really mean to do that. And then we say amen. And you go, just a minute. And you collect them all up. And you say, well, I'll be back next week, Tom. We'll get rid of them again. Jesus said, man, leave them here. Leave them here. He must, he must come in here on Monday morning and clean it up. Even before sending those guys come on Friday. Jesus already vacuumed all your junk up. Casting all your care upon him. Because he cares for you. Shame. Sexual abuse. Adultery, abortions, rejection, failure, tragedy, all things that, that the enemy encapsulates in shame. Listen, the enemy would like to, would like 
for you to believe this lie that you're defective that there's something wrong with you but here's the problem with that you're made in the image of God and God's not ineffective there's nothing wrong with him so when we hear that it's a demonic voice coming from the pit of hell shame and shame's a big thing shame keeps stuff hidden but here's what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 53. That he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Not we're going to be healed. We are healed. Listen. If you hear nothing but this today, Jesus took your shame. And so when shame comes to visit me, it's not, doesn't live here. Jesus took my shame on the cross 2,000 years ago. Pastor Clint was talking about emblems today when we, as we took communion, the cup and the bread. You know, the cross is an emblem. It was an emblem of shame. And Jesus transferred that emblem of shame into a trophy of righteousness. Today, the devil is going to lose his foothold on your stronghold. Here's why. is because we are going to ask Jesus to be the Lord of our pain. You know, I had you do this last week. I'm going to have you do it again. I, and, and I want it just to be a free will thing, not be, feel forced to do it. But the reason we carry this stuff around is, and, and it's not exposed is because we're ashamed of it and we don't want everybody to, under, to, to, to know about that. And I understand that because I'm, I'm just like you in that. But, but we can't hide it from Jesus. We, we have to make him the Lord of that pain. And so whatever it is that's caused that that. That shame, that, you know, the, the, the five sources of the failure, the, the tragedy, the, uh, you know, rejection, the betrayal, all, all these things. You know, whatever it was that, that, that caused this, this pain and this hurt, that I can't hide it from Jesus. And he's standing at the door and knocking, saying, listen, you know what, if you will open that door, I'm going to take that thing today. I'll take it from you. You don't have to carry it anymore. You're not designed to carry it. But if you'll open that door, I'm going to take that from you. That, you know, that, trust, that, that trust issue that you have that you don't trust other people because somebody hurt you. You know what? Give that to me today. You, know, you can walk out of this place changed today if you give me that pain. So last week I said this. If, if you identify with this you, and you, you have some shame inside you or you have some uh, source of a, an unhealed emotional scar on the inside of you and we all have them at some point at some place and maybe something we said today kind of uncovered some of that again I'm not telling you that to remind you of the pain I'm, I, I'm, I'm telling you that to remind you that Jesus is here to heal it so last week I said this I, if you identify that I want you to stand and, and I've just prayed for people that were standing and you know what? And just the fact that you stood identified with the emotional pain. It identified the need that, you know what? Jesus, I am making you the Lord of this pain. We didn't pray that last week, but that's what we were doing. And you, you might even stood last week when we prayed for that and, and still feel some of that emotional pain. Maybe you still feel all of it. But you know what? Today, let's make Jesus the Lord of that pain. Let him carry it. He took your shame already. You're not supposed to carry it. So that's what I'm going to do. And I'm, I'm going to count to three in just a second. And on three, I want every person in this room or, you know what, if you're watching online, we appreciate you watching online. And you, can, you can do this where you're at. If you're driving the car, it might be hard. But I'm going to count to three, and if you identify with, man, I need Jesus to take this pain, I'm going to have you stand, and we're just going to pray. 
I can't do a thing for you, but he can do everything for you. So what we're standing for right now is this. I got some emotional hurt, some pain, some scars inside that have not really been healed. Tried to deal with them myself. Tried to stuff them. Tried to hide them. Keep them from being exposed. And today I want to give them to Jesus. If that's you, that's who we're going to pray for right now on three. I want you to stand. One, two, three. Just stand. Stand. Thank you. I want you to close your eyes. I'd like for you to lift your hands towards heaven. I would like for you in your mind to leave this place and to enter into the kingdom of heaven right now and see Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father make an intercession for you right now. He prayed for this moment that you would surrender this pain to him because he can heal it. I want your mind and your focus to be upon what Jesus has done for you, the, the price he paid on the cross. And I'm going to pray for you. In the name of Jesus, we bind Satan and we bind the spirit of shame. In Jesus' name, we speak righteousness over every individual that's standing today and every individual that's watching online today. We speak the righteousness of Christ that you have made us to be, Father, in the name of Jesus. You have completely and totally healed us, completely and totally taken away the, the scar and the pain and, and the hurt, God. You have completely taken it away because today we surrender that pain to you in Jesus' name. I want you to say that, Jesus, I give you my pain. I surrender my pain. In Jesus' name, Father, I ask, Lord, that as we surrender that pain, God, Lord, that this church, Lord, that this church becomes a, 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 a well of healing, God. Lord, for this community, Father God. Lord, that we're not just healed so that we can be healed. We're healed so that we can be healing to other people, Father. And so I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that, Lord, as we receive your healing, God, Lord, supernaturally by the power of the Holy Spirit, I pray that you move, move across the sanctuary, God. Move on those that are watching online this morning, Father. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, we release that to you, God. And Lord, we ask that you'll come in and heal, and heal these scars, God. In Jesus' name, we command the stronghold of shame to break right now. By the power of the Holy Spirit, by the blood of Jesus, Jesus, you took our shame. You took our shame on the cross, and so we apply that blood to our lives, and we break. Say that I break. I come out of agreement. Say that, I come out of agreement. Say it again, I come out of agreement with the spirit of shame. Thank you, Lord. Now let me pray for you. I'm going to speak to your, your healed emotional scar. I say that by faith because that's exactly what, that's exactly what the Word of God says. Father, I thank you for the healing of these emotional scars this morning. Even though we might remember them, a scar leaves a mark, we can see it. But Lord, we know that, that that thing's been healed. Why? Because you've touched it today. Because we surrendered it to you today. And, and Lord, and tomorrow when we get up, we might surrender it again to you if it tries to come back. We surrender our pain to you, Father. We, we apply the truth of the word of God. Lord, how you see it and how you've done, you know, done things in our life before and how you do it with this, God. Lord, that we'll be healed, God, that you'll use this healing, Lord, to, to help other people that have walked through similar things or maybe something totally different. But we have compassion. We have compassion, Lord, because you have healed us, Lord, and you, the work that you've done today. And so today I speak to that scar. And I tell that scar in your life that it will become a trophy. That it will be something that, that God will use in the future and it will be your most powerful ministry. The thing that the enemy meant to destroy you with, God will turn around and use it for good. 
in Jesus' name, the, the addiction that you had, God's going to use that for good. Even the abuse that you had to go through, God's going to use that for good. You might not see it right now, but listen, he's redeemed that scar by the blood of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, I just pray now, just let the Holy Spirit move. Don't get uncomfortable. Just let the Holy Spirit move right now. Just let him touch you. That's what he's wanting to do. A lot of times we're moving too fast. I want you to receive that from him right now. Receive it. Receive that healing from him. That's what this whole thing was about, was you being healed of these emotional scars. Would you say this, Jesus? I receive it in Jesus' name. Father, I pray for any that are here today, maybe that are not born again, that are outside a relationship with you, either here or watching online today. We ask, Lord, that you'd make yourself real in their lives. Lord, that they would confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that you are who you said you are, that you are the Son of God, that you died for our sins and God raised you from the dead. And, and because of that, we can have eternal life if we believe that. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Tom, I don't know if I'm going to heaven. I don't know if Jesus is the Lord of my life. That's the start of all this. If that's you, would you slip your hand up? I'll, right there where you're at, I'll pray for you. If you're not positive that you're going to heaven, I'm going to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. And if you're, I'm looking around the room, anybody that, that say, Pastor Tom, include me in that prayer, I want you to raise your hand if, if you're here today. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Okay, so the, for the sake of one, we'll pray this prayer. Let's say this. Say, Jesus. Now, we need to say that with more than just our words. We need to believe this in, on the inside of us with our heart. If I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, I'd be saved. And so that's what we're saying. Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins and God raised you from the dead and I'm a sinner and I'm undone and I need my sins forgiven. So I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. I repent. I turn to you. Give me your strength. Give me your power. Fill me with the Holy Spirit today and help me live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless. We'll see you. See you next week. Oh, oh, yeah. I always forget we have announcements. Welcome, <laughs> Pastor Harlan. Praise God. You may be seated this morning. I tell you, ain't God good? I tell you, God spoke to my heart, man. Woo, I tell you, we'll take it this week. We're living in victory. Amen. So we just have a couple announcements for September. So look at the video announcements and... Here we go. Hey, church family. We're so glad you could be here today. And if you're a first-time guest, we want to thank you for joining us. Please fill out the welcome card and turn into an usher at our information table located in the foyer of the church to receive your free gift. This allows us to get to know you better and also provides additional information about our church. Let's see what's happening in the month of September. Hey everybody, I just want to remind you of the prayer times we have here at the church. Monday mornings at 10 a.m. and Tuesday evenings at 7 p.m. Really want to encourage you to look and see if there's something you can work into your busy schedules. Your presence will really make a difference. Hey guys, what's up? We got a weekend you happening on Wednesday nights with our pre-service activities at 6.30 p.m. and service to follow at 7. Our goal is simple, to awaken you to the saving power of Jesus Christ and to empower you with the knowledge of who God is. Hope to see you there. Heart and Soul Young Adults Ministry will be on Sunday, September 13th at 2.30 p.m. and September 28th at 7 p.m. Please see myself or Pastor Rachel for more details. Hey guys, in September, our monthly Kingdom Men meetings will be on the 14th and the 28th. It's potluck, so remember we eat, we share, 
we take communion, and most important, the Holy Spirit is there to guide us. And we always say that vulnerability brings about breakthrough. And man, you know us, we need breakthrough. So be there. And ladies, I have not forgotten about you. We are going to meet again here at the church September 21st at 6.30. Looking forward to seeing all of you. Hey, we want to invite you September 20th to our all-church baptism. So if you want to be baptized, you're welcome to come. And if you want to come and watch, you're welcome to come. So September 20th, we're doing that at Reeds Bay. Uh, if you want to get baptized September 13th, we're having a class here at 11 a.m. I uh, look forward to having you. Hey, Kids Space family, we're excited to announce starting September 20th, during our 11 a.m. service, we'll begin in-person Kids Church for children in preschool and kindergarten. We'll be taking safety precautions such as temperature checks and asking a few questions before check-in. We haven't forgotten the rest of the kids. For those currently in first through sixth grade, we'll be meeting virtually via Zoom every Sunday at 4 p.m. Please see Pastor Harden or Pastor Sheena for more details. Hi, everybody. I want to invite you to a prayer event that we have here at the church on September 26th. It will be from 3 a.m., 3 p.m. and it's called The Return. You can find out more about it at thereturn.org. It's an incredibly powerful time and it's time that we really need to come together and pray for our nation. And now let's get ready to give our tithes and offering. If you're a guest, please don't feel obligated to give. If you're prepared to give, we have three options available. You can give online at thehousehealer.com by clicking on the Give tab. Or directly through PushPay app texting the house seal of 277977. And of course, you can continue to give in person by dropping your gift in the box at the back of the sanctuary. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next week. Woo, yeah. Isn't that wonderful? Let's stand this morning. I tell you, God is good. All right. Father God, we thank you for this time of worship. We thank you for speaking to our hearts. I pray as we leave this building that you would do it within us, God. I pray you bless your people. Keep them safe this week. I pray that you just cover them with your blood and your spirit, God, as they walk through, walk through whatever they need to walk through, God. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed. Have a wonderful week.